So we're connecting Jesus with his mother, whose name was mentioned, Mary. When we look at her name, it's actually the Greek translation of the Hebrew name, Mary. Her name <coughs> means rebellion or burns. Mary, has, Mary, the mother of Jesus, has many titles. Mother of mercy, mother most blessed, queen of heaven, heaven, mother most pure, virgin most powerful, and spiritual vessel. Most of the titles that we get from Mary, guess what denomination or religion they come from? It comes from the Catholic Church. So every name and title I mentioned there that we refer to as Mary really don't come from our perspective, but they come from the Catholic perspective, but they are names attributed to her. Mary is born right around 20 B.C. How do we conclude that Mary was born right around 20 B.C.? We base this conclusion on the fact that Jesus was born somewhere between 6 and 4 B.C., and that Mary's approximate age upon giving birth to Jesus would have been right around 14. So by taking that into consideration, we place her birth date right around 20 B.C. And she was born in Nazareth. We get that from Luke chapter 1, verse 26, which I read by accident. And of course I flipped. But if we read that verse again, and in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So Mary herself was from Nazareth. If we wanted to take into consideration and do a little bit more investigating to find out what her nationality was, obviously what was her nationality? Who were her people? Jews. Jews. She was a she was Jewish. She was a Hebrew. She was an Israelite. And we put her date of death right around 36 AD to 40 <coughs> AD. And her burial, where she's buried at, according to tradition, and it, we can line it up according to the Word of God to a degree, is that of Ephesus. History, historical records state that Mary died and that she was buried in Ephesus. And we'll talk more about her, her connection with Ephesus here in a little bit. And how did Mary end up in Ephesus, all the way from Jerusalem? In Psalms chapter 32, 132 and verse 11, if someone would please find Psalm 132 verse 11, I'll find Romans chapter 1, 3. And if someone else would please find <coughs> Revelation 5, 5, we can find out which tribe that Mary was from. If someone has Psalms 132 and verse 11, go ahead and read it. Judah. Who were Mary's parents? 
In order to find that out, we go to one of those fun chapters that everyone loves to read when they're doing their daily <coughs> work. We're going to go to the genealogies. So genealogy of Mary is found in Luke chapter 3, verse 23. Luke 3, 23. Someone will please find that. And a side note, while we're talking about genealogy. One of the largest contradictions that people try to claim that there are in the Bible to prove that it's inaccurate is a Jesus' lineage. Remember, <laughs> Matthew also records the lineage of Je uh, Jesus, but he records it from Joseph's side, and Mary records the genealogy, or Luke records the genealogy from Mary's side. And what does Luke chapter 3, verse 23 state? Jesus himself began to about 30 years of age beginning, as was supposed. The son of Joseph, which was the son of Eli. Did I say that right? Eli. Eli. So Mary's father was Eli. Now, there is nothing mentioned of Mary's mother throughout all of Scripture. Scripture is silent on it. When scripture is silent on it, and we're trying to prove something, what is the best thing that sometimes we just have to say and just rest it? If someone's asking us a, qu a question important to the Bible or something about the Bible, and the Bible doesn't state clearly that it's in there, what is sometimes the conclusion we have to come to? We just don't know. Sometimes that is the best conclusion we can come to because we cannot add to the Bible. If it's not there, sometimes we just don't know. Scripture is silent on the name of the, of the mother of Mary. However, there are people out there that claim that Mary's real parents were really Jochem, Jochem and Anne. <coughs> you, Jason. Yes. You're saying if you can't find something in the Bible, there ain't nothing else that you can research to get the answer to your question. The Bible states that Joseph was the, was the father of Jesus. Let's go with that. If we look at scripture, maybe we can't find it, but we don't know. And if somebody's asking us, what was the name of Joseph, of Jesus' father? If we don't know, we don't know. However, there are some things, it doesn't matter how much research we do throughout the word of God, Mary's mother's name is not mentioned anywhere in Scripture. So for us to go and take something that might be historical records or something and say, well, this must be the mother of Jesus, that's us jumping to conclusions. The, if the Bible doesn't say it, and we've read it, even if we've read it perfectly, and we know, if it doesn't say that it's there, that's not true. It's not necessarily not true, but we don't know. I mean, it just comes down to, we just don't know. Was Mary's mother alive when she was growing up? Maybe. Did she die of childbirth? Maybe. Did she die sometime during her uh, childhood? Maybe. We don't have any information on that from the Word of God. Because there are people out there that, like I was just getting to, that will claim that Mary's real parents were Jochum and Anne. Guess where they take that from? Remember those books that we were talking about that the Catholics referred to? for a lot of their uh, beliefs that really don't line up with the Word of God, like praying to the dead. Do you remember what the name of those books are called? Five books of the saints. The books of saints, I like that one, brother, but not quite. What do sometimes we refer to as the end of the world? Starts with a giant A. Apocalypse. Apocalypse. Apocrypha are the false books that they add to the Bible. And when we talk about the false books, remember we refer to them as their name doesn't refer to as end time events, but rather they literally translate to false teachings. And even the Jews, when they were written, did not believe that they were fact. The names of Mary's parents that some will claim come from this false book, the Apocrypha, or maybe even other books. But when it comes to the Word of God, when we study the Word of God, our primary focus is the Bible. It doesn't matter what everybody else says. Somebody has a translation for this verse and they have a commentary for this verse. You can have ten different people all saying ten different things about the same verse. 
But what does the Word of God state? And when it comes to Mary's parents, the Word of God informs us her dad's name was Hela, but nowhere does it mention her mother. I'm talking about Mary. I know, but it's Mary's genealogy. So it's Mary's mother. It gets a little confusing, but it is Mary's mother. Or Mary's father. I know. It's referring to because they were referring to the man instead of the woman at that time. But it was her father. It was Mary's father. And we all know who her spouse was. We find that in, and we're not going to read these passages for the sake of time, but we can jump to Matthew 1 and verse 18. We can look at Luke 1, 27, Luke 2, 5. And scripture informs us who was Mary's spouse to? I know, brother, that was the grand revelation of this season, right? Mary was espoused to Joseph. No one knew that one. And that if we read Matthew chapter 13, <coughs> verse 55, we find that she had children. And I was looking here on the paper there, those specifically mentioned by name. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, we would find that James... Joseph, Simeon, and Judas are mentioned. We know that she had other children. We know that she had daughters. <coughs> because remember that verse where Jesus goes back to minister in his own country? We read this earlier. He said, is this not the son of Mary whose brothers and Artemis and his sisters are with them? So he had half stepbrothers. He had stepsisters or half brothers, however you want to refer to it as. And in Luke chapter 2, 24, we find out her social status. If someone would please read Luke chapter 2 and verse 24. And all her sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, and pair of turtle doves are two men. So in the temple, they sacrificed two turtle doves or two young pigeons. I should have included another verse in this. How do we know that this describes their social status? Well, we have to go back to the book of Leviticus and read one of those passages, or Exodus as well, possibly, and go back to one of those passages that we don't really like to read so much. We don't dread them as much as the genealogies, but we start talking about the laws, how if you're in this class, you need off of this, and if you're in that class, you need off of that. Two turtle doves and two young pigeons was the sacrifice offering for an individual who was poor. They didn't have a lot of money. So even growing up, we see Mary's social status. We see Joseph's social status. No, it was not the norm to marry outside of your social class. What would have been unusual if a poor woman married a rich man. That would have been uncommon. But normally you married within your class because the higher-ups were too snooty. They didn't want anything to do with the lower class or they were just peasants. So more than likely, you marry within your class. That's the way it is today. Kind of in the world, isn't it? The rich married the rich, and the medium married medium, and the poor you marry the poor. For the most part. You know, I, I think it's like that. I mean, we can't. I mean, that's the way I think. Yeah. So we find out that according to Luke 2, 24, <laughs> we find that Mary was poor. And we try to find out her age of betrothal, We'd place that at the age of 12 and 15. We have that in our notes for personal reference, but does scripture anywhere state her actual age of betrothal? It does not. So we're basing this upon historical evidence, and we're basing this upon the norm of that time. Normally a woman was married between the age of 12 and 14, at the most 15. In fact, 15 was actually considered old for a woman to, or a girl to get married. Now, we're not going to read her genealogy, but we can find Mary's genealogy in Luke chapter 3, verses 23 through 38. And if we were going to look at her life and find out where all she lived throughout her lifetime, we, let's go ahead and read that because I do want to do a little bit of tracing with this one. 
If someone would please find Luke chapter 1, 26 and 27. Luke 1, 26 and 27. If someone else would find Matthew chapter 2, 13 and 14. Matthew 2, 13 and 14. And I will find John chapter 19 and 26. If someone has Luke chapter 1, 26 and 27. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to the virgin of God's children name, whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So Mary lived in Nazareth. Where else did she live? Someone please read Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. When they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. So Mary, at one point in her life, lived in Nazareth. Where was the second place she lived in her lifetime? Egypt. And then finally, we can trace that she lived in Ephesus as well. Now this takes a little bit more digging. But when we look throughout the Word of God, in John chapter 19, verse 26, the Bible states, And after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas... And why am I looking? <coughs> and it would help if I got it over the right chapter. So let's go from chapter 20 back to verse to chapter 19, where we were supposed to be, and read verse 26. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, whom did Jesus love? Is he referring to in this passage? Yeah. John's referring to himself in this passage. He saith unto his mother, Woman, behold, behold thy son. And then he, we'll go down to verse 27 as well. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took care of her unto his own home. When we look at the tradition of the time, when we look at the life of Christ, specifically his ministry. From the age of 12 to the beginning of his ministry, or the wedding there at Cana, there is no mention of Jesus at all. But it picks up there at the wedding at Cana. But there's also no mention of Joseph. We find that Joseph was with Mary looking for Jesus in the temple, when he rebuked them and said, do you not know I need to be about my father's uh, business when he was teaching the scribes and the Pharisees talking? But during Jesus' ministry, there is no mention of Joseph. When we look at all the siblings or the children that Mary had, who was the eldest? Jesus. Jesus was the eldest. And when the husband, who is the man of the house, passed away, whose responsibility did it fall on to take care of everything? The oldest. The oldest. So who was responsible for taking care of Mary during Jesus' ministry? Jesus was. But Jesus was about to die on the cross and then ascend into heaven 40 days later. Which means... He still was responsible for Mary unless he placed someone else in charge of her. I thought on the cross, he, uh, I thought on the cross, didn't he uh, uh, say that uh, one of the disciples or something that could take care of him, take care of his, his Mary? Yes, he did. And that's what we're talking about right here. On the cross, Jesus instructed John the Beloved to take John. care of Mary. Yeah. Why did he do that? Because originally Jesus was responsible for her. But now he was about to go away and he needed to make sure that his household was in order in every aspect. 
I mean, on the cross, there were so many things taking place on the cross. Even while Jesus was dying, he was ministering and still taking care of business in his dying breaths. Even with the heavenly issue and with his earthly issues. He was making sure everything was taken care of. And he said, John, you are now responsible for taking care of Mary. You know, out of the original 12 disciples, there's only one who was never martyred in his lifetime that died a natural death. It didn't mean that people didn't try to. But there was only one that survived. Yeah. Yeah. Was it because it was divine appointment? Was it luck? I don't think it was luck. According to church history, they claim that they tried to boil the eyes of John the, ba of John the Beloved out with hot oil. Yeah. And when that did not succeed, they aisled him to the aisle of Patmos. Now here's the thing. If we trace the life of John the Beloved, his last living location before he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos was Ephesus. If we would look at church history, if we would look at secular history, there's even a church dedicated and built over in Ephesus to Mary. There are strong indications that she was buried there, even historically. The scriptures say that she was buried there. No. But there are historical evidence that she was buried there. And if nothing else, we can at least trace her living there through the life of John the Beloved. Because we can actually tie John the Beloved through Scripture, even though I don't have it all laid out here, to being under the leadership of that young preacher, Timothy, who was the pastor at Ephesus. So Mary lived in Nazareth. She lived in Egypt. And through tracing the life of John the Baptist, John the Baptist, John the Beloved through Scripture, we can place her in Ephesus. When we start looking at Mary in general, she is probably the most prominent parent of Jesus. Why is she probably the most, parent of Jesus, most prominent parent of Jesus? First of all, you have the Immaculate Conception. She was not a perpetual virgin like the um, Catholics teach but she was a virgin at the time of Jesus' birth. It was immaculate. And we can talk all about the sin sacrifice we want that Jesus was to be, how it had to be perfect. We can talk about the how sin was passed down through Adam and not Mary. But when we look at Mary, she was the pro most prominent parent, probably because she's the one that Scripture focused on the most. Because she had the largest role when it came to God intervening into someone's life and raising up the Son of God. Was Joseph an important part? Absolutely. He was the breadwinner. He was his earthly father. But when we look at Mary, she was the one who, around whom the Christmas story focuses. The virgin who conceives and brings forth the Son of God, who will have the entire world placed upon his shoulder. <coughs> then you have the second aspect of it all. That apparently Joseph had passed away before Jesus' earthly ministry began. And because of that, there is no mention of him from that point on. So naturally, Mary's going to play a key role and be the most prominent parent because she was the initial key at the beginning and Joseph was not around at the end. We can trace Mary also being born through... Jewish tradition with her age, but we can also trace it through historical records and through the fact that Cyrenius was governor at that time over Syria. If we look at Cyrenius, he served two rules, two terms ruling over Syria. He served, first of all, from 6 to 4 BC, and that was a, a military rule, or primarily for military purposes. And then he ruled again from 6 to 9 AD. So when we're placing Jesus' birth and guessing and guessing Mary's age, the rule of Cyrenius also plays a factor because we have that mentioned and documented in Scripture if we go to the book of Luke. 